C3PO in your living room. Microsoft has a new magic wand. Why gamers want to mod Watch Dogs 2. And Snapchat is in copyright trouble again. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1536, recorded Thursday, June 16th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Zerto, virtual replication and disaster recovery technology that gives you the confidence to keep your business moving forward no matter what comes your way. Zerto empowers you to protect and recover your IT assets, move to the cloud, and know you're ready for anything. Get a free readiness assessment for your data center at confidentcio.com. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service and the most sophisticated way to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit Wealthfront.com slash TNT and sign up to get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash TNT. This is Tech News Today, the show where we use a very complicated algorithm of stuff I like, stuff Jason likes, stuff we think you'll like, to come up with the best tech news stories of the day. Mm -hmm. I am Megan Maroney. And I am Jason Howell. We just take all those things and we smoosh them together into a giant tech sandwich. Mm -hmm. Slather some mayonnaise on it. Or do you not like mayonnaise? Are you not a mayonnaise I fan? I'm okay with ma tech mayonnaise. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Not quite sure where this is going, but I blame myself because I said sandwich. I blame you too. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> right, should we get started? <laughs> Let's, I think so. I think it's time. All right. Magic Leap. It's the elusive augmented reality technology that we've been hearing about and been seeing videos of for years now. Today, Wired has a video shot directly through Magic Leap technology, and it features none other than the cast of Star Wars. Peter Rubin at Wired says Magic Leap and Lucasfilm have entered a strategic alliance to create mixed reality technology together. They will set up a secret lab on the Lucas campus in the Presidio in San Francisco. Now, of course, Google and others have put over $500 million into Magic Leap, but so far we have no timeline as to when we will be hanging out with C-3PO on our living room couch the next web's Nat Garen quotes industry experts who say we might see a prototype of this at 2017. Jason, Star Wars in your living room, uh -huh. overlaid on your life, I'll, yes I'll, or no? I'll take it. Yes. Well. Uh, yes. This is the kind of tech sandwich that makes me salivate right here. <laughs> um, I, you know what, what's really impressive about this, what, what continues to impress me about this, though I have questions, is kind of like when you're watching the video and you see... Um, you see R2-D2 roll up to the table, knows that the table is there, knows to plug into the table, and then the thing, you know, the hologram is cast on top of it. And I think that just kind of illustrates the power of what what we think Magic Leap is going to be able to do. But really, all we know about Magic Leap is that it's AR and these little videos that you get that all say the same thing down at the bottom, which is that what you are seeing is is actually from the device. There's no, you know, pre-rendered stuff, no uh, digital, you know, magic underneath. It's pretty much direct from the device. We don't really know much more than that, but I'm pretty excited by what we see, this included. Yeah. I mean, but there are journalists who we trust who, sure. who, who like, have seen it, and mm -hmm. they're not just showing these videos that Magic Leap has handed right. to them. So, I mean, for that reason, I, I trust it. Uh, it is interesting. It's interesting that they, these two together, because I feel like Star Wars, the Star Wars franchise is what brought us the idea of augmented huh, reality. I mean, from some people, it was Star Trek, I'm sure. But like the holograms, you know, mm -hmm. just that that was, to, that was that's where I first learned that this was eventually possible in a galaxy far, far away, a <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> I well, it was a long time ago in 1978 when Star Wars came yeah. out, so... <laughs> Uh, here we are. It's the future, 20, 2016, and we're going to actually see it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. This was announced at the Wired Business Conference in New York City. Um, but I, I want a date. I, I want to know when mm -hmm. to get to see it. Looking forward to that, too. Peter Jackson, of course, director of Bad Taste and Dead Alive. Oh, uh, movies you've probably heard of 
Lord of the Rings series, <laughs> um, serves on the advisory panel for the company. He is very, I mean, obviously he's super excited uh, enough to be on the advisory panel, but you know, he basically has said in the past that he thinks augmented reality is going to be bigger than mobile in 10 years and more exciting than VR uh, for this very reason. And also Warner Brothers is, was part of the $1.4 billion uh, financing round for Magic Leap. So obviously lots of Hollywood ties, lots of ties into the film industry. And that makes me even more excited because then you think of, you know, taking this, this, this groundbreaking kind of new visual platform and bringing Hollywood money and Hollywood vision into it. And I think, I think the, the outcome is go going to be that we're going to get some pretty immersive, um, high quality experiences from whatever it happens to be. Exactly. And I think, I mean, those, I've heard some people talk about the HoloLens developer kit that's out in the wild now. Uh, and their descriptions sound pretty awesome too. You know, they, you mm -hmm. have characters from games just like hanging out on your couch. You know, you can put things in people's, you know, people put things in fish tanks, you know, things like that. So it, it does look really cool. And at least there are those prototypes. I mean, those devices are out in the world. You know, if you have $4,000 and you're a developer, you can get one yourself too. So it's a little further along, but yeah, we haven't seen these kinds of these same kinds of deals yeah very curious to know price too i mean that price is that's going to be a big big part of this uh, whether it's even possible that we could have this in our house or not or if this is something you go somewhere to ex experience uh many have discussed how apple's upcoming ios 10 includes the ability to remove its core apps from the device even if it comes preloaded. but in reality it turns out you aren't actually deleting those apps from the device instead you are disconnecting the hooks and deleting the associated uh, user data with those apps. That app is actually going to still remain on the device. It will take up that storage space, uh, though you won't be bothered by the icon, you know, that's just there on your home screen. Um, I think, and I think a big part of this is, and Apple has has said as much that these apps and services are baked into the OS. It's a reason, you know, it's one of the reasons that in order to get updates to these apps, you you know, on iOS, you're actually waiting for the next version of the OS to be updated and then those apps by extension are also updated so it's so intertwined in that in this case basically uninstalling it means removing it from view uh, deleting that extra data but the binary still exists on your device so that might take up a little bit of space and then if you want it back you actually do go to the app store and reinstall it and that just basically makes it um, discoverable again. Yeah, I mean, they're not doing this just to be horrible. Apple isn't leaving these, you know, these apps on our desktop to be horrible. So at least they've let us sweep them away, you know, because mm -hmm. before it sort of feels like in some way our home screen is our living room and there are these yeah. like ads for Apple sitting in there that they we couldn't get rid of. We could stick them in a drawer, but they, the drawer would still be there. You know, we could stick them in a mm -hmm. folder. Uh, but so it's nice that they've let us, um, you know, sweep them off. But I would, I would also like to have the storage space back, but I understand why they're doing this. Like yeah, this. and I mean, that would only really matter if you have, let's say, the 16 gig uh, iPhone, which apparently rumors are saying that there won't be a 16 gig iPhone, you know, going forward. That remains to be seen. Uh, but I know how Google has handled this, at least in the last um, couple of years, especially, is that they've unbundled a bunch of the apps. Because Google was always really kind of criticized for um, you know, the lack of updates on a system level. And so, um, you know, for security reasons or whatever, OEMs just don't do that uh, as often as they probably should. And so Google has taken it upon themselves to take these apps that were initially bundled into the OS, unbundling them through the app store. So when you remove them, they actually are fully removed and they don't occupy space uh, on the device. But there are certain things that are just core to the OS that you can't do that with. And I think that's what we're seeing here with Apple as well. Well, Microsoft is making its second big acquisition of the week. The Redmond company has purchased Wand Labs, a messaging app developer who now wants to start thinking beyond the app ecosystem. Writing in Fast Company, Harry McCracken says Microsoft's acquisition of Wand Labs coupled with the purchase of LinkedIn points to a new Microsoft fo focused on big data, bots, and all the app services in between. So this is really interesting. I mean, this is uh, another sort of, um, you know, they've obviously heard as we have been announcing the app ecosystem is over. It's now no longer apps. It's going to be a bigger, uh, more fluid world. So this seems mm -hmm. to be Microsoft's foray into this uh, bot world, which I, I think also these companies don't, they're not really calling them bots so much anymore. 
Um, I, I know when Facebook announced those messaging bots, so far they've been kind of like, uh, you know, not so mm -hmm. great. So hopefully Microsoft can do it a little bit better. Yeah, from from what I can tell and from what I was reading, this is really part of uh, Satya Nadella's conversation as a platform. This was a strategy that, that was announced to build uh, this year, basically making human language the the UI layer for the operating system and for all Microsoft products. So what um, what Wand has done, conversational um, interfaces that they've created, third-party developer integration, so allowing developers to kind of tap into this, services mapping, all this stuff is, I mean, plays to the heart of what Microsoft is, is doing right now, opening things up so that developers can kind of tap into this AI world in Microsoft's apps um, and products, you know things like Skype and whatever create create those chatbots that exist in Skype, whatever they happen to be. This seems like a no-brainer. Um, I guess Wan Labs was in a closed beta, and they're basically shutting that down, and it's just going to start folding into Microsoft products right away. Uh, you know what's cooler than one billion dollars? Seven one billion dollars. Actually, $7.3 billion to be exact. That is the amount of new financing that Chinese ride-sharing company Didi Chuxing just raised. I might be saying that wrong, and if I am, I apologize. Email us, tnt at twit.tv. Let me know how I'm not saying that correctly. Uh, Didi Chuxing is beating Uber in more ways than one. First, by being way more popular than Uber in China. And second, by making Uber's recent uh, groundbreaking $3.5 billion funding round look like no big deal in comparison. This is like twice that. Apple is one of the investors here sitting at $1 billion investment into DD. Uh, also, a few Uber investors are part of DD's fund, including BlackRock, which invested in Uber in 2014, and China Life, which is Asia's biggest insurance firm. Uh, in DD Chuxing's Four Year Life, it's really just kind of come to dominate the space in China, and uh, investors there are hedging their bets by backing both in some cases, just to be sure. Yeah, I mean, China has more internet users than anyone in the world. Uh, they have a growing, a quickly growing middle class. So this is um, a place, you know, we talk about Uber in the United States, Uber in Austin, the importance of Uber in Austin, but like really uh, in the bigger scheme of things, this is huge. Uh, and if Didi is, is there and bigger, uh, in China, then it's going to be great for them. And I, what I found is interesting talking, it's interesting, like you said, that there's some investors are investing in both. Mm -hmm. Apple, of course, is a big investor uh, in Didi. And Google Ventures is a big investor in Uber, which was something that I didn't know, uh, which was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Didi apparently has more than $10 billion cash, cash in hand, no big deal, uh, has a quite a war chest. So, you know, Uber, it's interesting, it's, it's very interesting to see Uber's kind of um, kind of relationship with the whole Chinese market, right? They're aiming to be dominant in 12 months' time. They, they want 12 months from now to be more dominant than DD. They have a lot to overcome as far as that's concerned. Uh, China is one of Uber's top four cities and most important market, but I mean, DD eclipses, you know, Uber's, Uber's existence in China. So, you know, the kind of I think what what that points to is that the ten billion dollars that Didi has kind of overshadows a lot of the um, kind of incentives that Uber can give its drivers, and really empowers Didi to just have a lot of muscle to to hit back and basically command their uh, I don't know their in their authority or whatever you want to call it in in China and make sure that uh, you know nothing moves there. Um, they're profitable. And, profitable in 200 of 400 cities in China, and they're only at around 1.1% of the entire market right now. They think over the next two years, this is like a $200 billion market. Uh, so there's a lot of money to be made. That tells you exactly why Uber and DD are vying so heavily for, for China. Right. And transportation is a much easier market to get into in China than when you're dealing with anything that has to do with the media mm. or anything like that, which is, you know, so many companies have run up against uh, so many problems in China. So this is sort sure. of like an easier in for them. Yeah. Uh, all right, coming up, some gamers are upset that the focal character of Watch Dogs 2 is a black hacktivist. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but before we get there, let's take a minute to thank Zerto, the sponsor of this episode. Zerto is IT asset protection. It's disaster recovery, and it's cloud continuity for confident CIOs. Confidence can make or break businesses uh, in today's IT world. It can mean the difference between hesitation 
and action, success or irrelevance. Zerto's cloud-based business continuity solutions arm today's CIOs and IT pros with the confidence to know their systems are ready for anything. With Zerto, you can recover from downtime, you can test new technology and move to the cloud in a matter of clicks while maintaining business continuity. Zerto's virtual replication technology gives you the power to simplify your migrations. You can switch to new infrastructure faster and get quicker ROI in a matter of clicks. You want to know your data is protected, and you will here with breakthrough hypervisor-based software that puts the power of continuous replication at your fingertips. You can migrate to the cloud with no disruptions with enterprise-class software that empowers you to seamlessly and safely move virtualized workloads between public, private, and hybrid clouds. Uh, get complete, comprehensive data protection in one smart solution for BCDR across storage and hypervisors. You can recover from any disruption with checkpoints every few seconds. You can protect and recover files, virtual machines, and applications uh, from any point in time. All sorts of stuff here to dig into. See for yourself how Zerto simplifies your data replication and disaster recovery. Plus, get a free readiness assessment uh, for your data center at confidentcio.com. That's confidentcio.com. We thank Zerto for their support. Renard from Chicago sent us an email asking if we could talk about an article in Fusion about Ubisoft's game Watch Dogs 2. I reached out to the author, journalist Charles Pulliam Moore, and I'm happy to welcome him to the show to talk about it. Welcome, Charles. Hey, Megan. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for coming on. So the game trailer came out last week, uh, and immediately people online had a lot to say about the new main character, Marcus Holloway. What's yeah. Marcus's backstory? Um, so Marcus is a black activist who's originally from Oakland, California. Um, and the game sort of centers around uh, this one moment in his life where he is falsely imprisoned um, because a, uh, I'm not really sure to describe it, like a pre-crime algorithm, right? That's sort of like analyzing what traditionally happens in his neighborhood and assumes that something's going to happen. Uh, the police come through, they scoop him up as opposed to whomever actually committed the crime. Um, and because he is a hacktivist in the world of watchdogs, he uses his tech to break out and sort of, you know, the adventure commences from there. So, so what kinds of things were, were gamers saying online uh, about this character after they saw the preview? Um, the sort of kind of like a standard issue problematic things that tend to pop up whenever you hear about black people in tech, right? Like, oh, like why would a black person be living in San Francisco? Even though Marcus is from, um, he's from Oakland, the game takes place mostly um, in San Fran. And unlike the original Watch Dogs, which was set in like a Chicago that was kind of unrecognizable, I say this as someone who used to live in Chicago, this San Francisco is very clearly based on the San Francisco that we are all sort of familiar with, right? Um, so you've got people living like very bohemian lifestyles you've got people living in poverty and then you've got this um this upper class of like high class tech workers um of which marcus is one of them and people were like well that's just not realistic um there was one particular um, thread in steam about how you know oh this is another instance of social justice warriors trying to force their agenda down our throats it was all just kind of like uh, okay all right why I mean, why aren't the big gaming houses kind of using their reach to be a little more representative as far as this kind of thing is concerned? You know, people people respond, you know, be, because I guess because they don't they're not used to seeing you know something outside of the the traditional white homogenous dude archetype. Why why aren't gaming companies kind of using their their kind of power and ability to kind of spread it out a little bit? Um, it's just sort of, I think there's like, there's a lot of different forces at work, right? Um, you have these publishers who are very accustomed to making a very particular kind of game. They usually tend to be centered around um, nondescript white men whom the gamer is supposed to be able to project themselves onto. The first Watch Dogs is main character. Um, goodness, his name is escaping me. Uh, honestly, like that's like that's part of it. He's supposed to be this sort of like nondescript white guy. And you're supposed to be like, oh, look, that could be me. Mm -hmm. um, Let's call him where, Pierce. Sure, yes. <laughs> um, but with Watch Dogs 2, it's just sort of like, no, 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 we're going to tell a very specific kind of story that is somewhat grounded in reality. Um, increasingly, you're seeing more and more publishers be like, well, you know, we have been doing this, you know, 
since the beginning of like since we've been in this business at the same time there's a very vocal contingent of underrepresented uh people women queer people people of color you know they're like we've been spending our money and our time and our energy playing these games um, it's about time that we were able to see ourselves in them more sure so uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about The Sims and modding, and this was something that I'd heard of, but I hadn't really, um, I didn't really fully understand. But you write that a lot of people were saying, well, we should be able to mod our white face onto Marcus Holloway's face. Why can't we do that? Um, is that something right. that people have been asking for for a long time the other way around? Like, why, why can't I make every white character black? Honestly, like that complaint only comes up when there's a black character. It's like, well, I can't see myself on this person anymore. And I sort of feel like I shouldn't have to spend my money. Um, but that being said, uh, earlier this year, there was actually a really interesting instance in which there was this pushback um, with an indie game um, called Stardew Valley. Um, it's a, uh, how to describe it? It's a farming game. Um, it's not quite like Harvest Moon, but the idea is that you inherit a farm from your grandfather. You move back to the farm, you farm the land. But the real like meat and bones of the game is where you go out into the community and you build these relationships, friendships, romantic relationships. Um, most of the characters are white, um, canonically. Um, there are a handful of characters of color, one of whom, Maru, was um, biracial. Um, she had one black parent, one white parent. And a mod came out that allowed you to make her skin lighter. Um, and a lot of people were like, well, what, why? You know, why is it that in a game that's so dense with white characters, you would want to make one of the few characters of color look more white? Um, that was a conversation, again, that popped up on Steam. Um, but in response to that, something really interesting came out of it. Um, the Diverse Star or Dew Valley project, um, which sort of took that initial mod and turned it on its head and said, well, we've already got this game, you know, that's got a hand, you know, a couple of dozen white characters why not make it so that the residents of Stardew Valley are from all kinds of backgrounds, right? Um, so this follow-up project allowed you to um, create a really vibrant, diverse community, whereas uh, as initially you only had two characters of color, um, using this mod allowed you to sort of like um, basically create a world that was a bit more reflective of the one that gamers are actually playing in. Um, and from there, the conversation has been sort of fraught around this one particular indie game um about well you know why is it okay for me to make a white color i'm sorry a white character um a person of color but not in the opposite um so there's like it's this it's two sides to a very like complicated conversation and i think that's where a lot of people who do mod want it to be you know it shouldn't just be a one directional thing um it's just that historically it's been mostly white characters so Watch Dog 2 was announced at E3 was there is, was there more conversation about this when there was more to see from the game um, so far, like a lot of the buzz online has just been about how it's looking to be the game that Watch Dogs 1 should have been, um, in that it's supposed to be this immersive, um, true to life real world experience that's, you know, slightly heightened. Um, the way that a lot of people are describing Watch Dogs 2, it's like, oh, it's like Assassin's Creed, but in San Francisco, um, where parkour makes a lot more sense. <laughs> um, um, and it's just sort of like, I feel like that buzz is actually sort of the subtext to a much larger positive conversation, right? So if uh, the initial big hit of buzz was this uh, fallout, not fallout, uh, this negative backlash to the fact that the character was going to be a, a man of color, the fact that the game looks like it's going to be fantastic and sort of right some of the wrongs that the initial game sort of set up, um, you know, critics love Watch Dogs 1, but if you go on the forums, people are like, this game was not great. Um, I feel like that could ultimately serve, like that's going to be able to push that conversation about the, ne like the necessity for more characters of color in gaming forward. So were, uh, your overall thoughts about E3, were there um, in terms of the diverse characters in games that were announced? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so E3, like I have, you know, the same kind of mixed feelings about E3 that every gaming nerd does. You know, you get really hyped up for it, then it comes, you're like, ah, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, basically all the major publishers uh, made a point of including um, either a woman or a person of color, or in some cases both, um, as main characters in their game, um, which is fantastic. Um, not necessarily, like, I want to say Ubisoft sort of like sh had the biggest showing out. Um, they had Aisha Tyler presenting on stage, and then, and then Watch Dogs 2 was sort of like their big announcement, uh, you know, for the event. Um, so they sort of like, in my mind, like won the prize. Um, 
in terms of just like uh, other forms of representation, I was a little bummed out uh, that the link that's going to be in the new Zelda game is not a girl. That was like that was sort of like some of the early buzz um, when the first shots of Link with uh, his pony, his side ponytails, and his new mm -hmm. tunic came out. We all thought, oh, maybe this will finally be like the first female Link, uh, but that's not quite the case. Um, but yeah. So what about representation? People uh, on on the uh on the stage, what, what, how did you feel about representation there in terms of people presenting the games? Um, so, like I said, Aicha Tyler was sort of like she's both a woman of color, and she's you know she's a person of color, and she's a woman. Um, she's been uh, she's done um, events for Ubisoft for the past couple of years. You know, she's sort of like a known brand for them, and it's been interesting that none of the other publishers have really sort of like followed suit. Um, Oftentimes, the response is, oh, well, you know, like, these people aren't people that work for us. Aisha Tyler is a comedian, you know, she's an actor, she's a, she's a self-professed gamer, and she's very vocal about representation in gaming. Um, but Ubisoft made the, uh, they took the initiative to reach out and sort of bring her into the fold. And that's the kind of thing that I would like to see from other publishers do more. Um, that whole idea that there aren't people of color out there who are interested in gaming or there aren't women or queer people who play these games is patently false you know you literally just have to swing a stick on tumblr or twitter and you will hit quite a few of us um so that's like if, if like if there's one thing that i take away from it i will rather if there's one thing that i'd like the publishers to take away from it's like you guys like there's a, like there's a vibrant community out there of people who are more than interested in getting involved and helping you know bring people to your product for sure. Well, Charles, thank you so much. Uh, Charles thank is a writer you. at Fusion. Uh, you have an, an intersection of politics and tech that is really uh, unique and, and interesting, oh. and I love your pieces, so thanks so much for coming on. And uh, I, Is Twitter the best place for people to find all your work? By all means, Twitter is the best place to find me. Um, all of my other digital homes are always changing around, but <laughs> twitter.com, at Charles Pulliam, I am always there. My notifications are always on. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Take care. Thank, Thank you, Charles. After the break, Snapchat is stealing filters from artists again. When will they learn? But first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter, the sponsor of this episode. The right candidates are out there, but these days you need some pretty powerful tools to find them. Do you know where to post your jobs to find the best candidates? Posting jobs in one place is not enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. That sounds exhausting, but with ZipRecruiter, you can do it. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job boards, including social media networks like Facebook, Twitter, Google+, all with a single click. Just post once and watch your candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. Search by skills, location, work experience, and more. ZipRecruiter's advanced matching technology delivers the most relevant candidates based on your criteria. ZipRecruiter also offers optimized pages that look great on any screen. Add their unique mobile apply process for more visitors and applicants. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide, so no more juggling emails or calls to your office. You can add multiple users to your account. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 800,000 businesses and is trusted by hundreds of Fortune 500 companies. So whether you're hiring now or you plan to hire in the near future, check out their blog for recruiting tips and hiring resources. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Access millions of resumes on ZipRecruiter with thousands of new ones added daily. ZipRecruiter is the fastest way to hire great people. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT, and we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. All right, so Snapchat filters are no doubt a lot of fun. They're one of the few things I open Snapchat for, actually. Uh, one of the key features of the service, but... There appears to be a running theme with some filters, and that's the fact that a handful of them seem to be straight up lifted from other artists. Joining us to chat a little bit about this is Molly McHugh from The Ringer. How's it going, Molly? Good. How are you guys? Fantastic. It's great to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I guess first things first, tell us how artists are discovering their creative work on Snapchat in ways that they didn't expect anyways. Uh, so... The artists I talk to, it's not like you or or me when we open Snapchat in the morning, you start like flipping through filters and seeing what the new ones are. They're seeing their work and they didn't sign off on it. And sometimes their friends see it and then they screenshot it and send it to them. Um, in one case, it was a sticker and not a filter, but the same kind of thing. She just opened it, was checking out the stickers and looked a little bit too familiar. So how... Um I guess I, I get a little baffled by this because this isn't the first time that we've heard about this. It was, I think, in May we heard about this around a different artist 
Oh, man, who was the artist? I, I, I have the link in here, but I can't, can't find the artist. But anyways, I mean, there's no doubt when you put these things side by side, you take the original artwork that it's based off of, and then you take the filter. Like, there's enough striking similarities. And actually, if you scroll down here, you'll, you'll start to see them. Where, I mean, it's just, it's pretty obvious that there is, there is some sort of lift going on here. How does Snapchat kind of rectify the, this repeatedly? Because I know they keep saying, like, oh, man. This really should not be happening. We promise it won't happen again. And then it happens again. How, how are they doing this? Right. I mean, when I first, I was actually just like searching around on for interesting Snapchat hashtags on Twitter. And I saw, I think it was Snapchat no swiping. I was like, I don't know what that means. And so I clicked in and saw all these people complaining about it. And of course, I went back and saw the article that was written in May about the original filter that had been lifted from someone else. And Snapchat said something like, we're going to pull this and we apologize or something to that effect, kind of acknowledging that something had happened. Um, and then these people I talked to, especially Mikey, who is glam and gore, very well-known uh, YouTube makeup artist, and she's all over the place. Um, she said they basically told her, like, we don't feel this constitutes, you know, we haven't done anything wrong. And that's when I was like, well, this happened pretty recently and it happened to someone else a week ago and happened to someone else a month ago. So clearly there's a routine problem happening. And and they've said, Snapchat said today, yes, we're going to make sure this doesn't happen anymore. And I don't know if that means there are new rules or a new person maybe picking these filters. Um, but I'm hoping some, there's some more oversight or s some more, some, someone seeing what's going on here. I mean, that's exactly what they said a month ago too. They said, uh, we're sorry for this embarrassing mistake and we're taking action to make sure it won't happen again. Uh, but it continues right. to, what were you going to say? Well, so the, the Fox drawings that we showed earlier, I mean, it's one thing to, I mean, co to copyright a drawing and then have that be used, but what about makeup and can makeup be copyrighted? Yes, it can, but it's really difficult. Uh, there's some precedent for it. I talked a little bit about how the musical Cats, the artist who it took her hours on hours on hours, finally went to court over this because people were selling face painting kits, coloring books, and she didn't see any profits from that, and she ended up winning. It's a lot harder with makeup, and it can't be everyday makeup. It has to be something that is face painting and is kind of a work of art and looks different. It can't be, you know, what you look like walking out of the house every day. You can't trademark your eyeliner maybe, right. but you can trademark a painting. Um, there's some stuff with the medium, whether it's tangible paper is recognized as a tangible medium, but skin, and that gets a little more difficult, but there's absolutely a way to do this. It's just harder. And do you think that Snapchat is, uh, this is really just an opinion question, but do you think they've moved from sort of stealing artist work to stealing makeup artist work because they know that? It's difficult? Maybe. I, I want to say no. What I kind of feel like, it, I'm like in my mind while writing this, trying to think, so what exactly would have happened? And I'm wondering, you know, these face filters, such a natural inspiration could be makeup artists and what they're doing. And, and so is someone going around looking for some popular looks over the course of the week? Right. Because mm -hmm. that's what I think about like fashion. It's very, I know you can copyright some fashion, but that's more difficult also, because it's fashion, it's what's in fashion. People want to be copied, um, and that's the same. Is that the same of the, with these makeup artists? Totally. A, a huge number of the videos they put up are tutorials. Actually, like go out and try and do this thing I did, uh, and you know, instructions, step by step instructions. So it's one thing when a fan is doing this, though, and another thing when I mean a very well valued company makes a lot of money is doing it. Yeah, no matter what the, the gray area is around it, Snapchat, like you're saying, makes a, a crap ton of money, uh, <laughs> you know? So it's not like they can't use that money on one of their most popular features that drives a lot of, of usage and, and a lot of money to the company to hire top-notch artists to do this instead of, uh, instead of hunting for art. Or are they just getting lucky? Is this just like a lucky coincidence repeatedly? I mean, is there any possibility of that? I have I have a feeling it's not, but. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think to, to me, it's one of those moments where you realize like a lot of creativity happens simultaneously, but I don't think that's what this is necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, you right. can say that and it's easier to find when something's been copied because it's easier to search it on the internet than it used to be. But these seem like too close, especially those Fox pictures. That I know, right? They're.
So uh, if if I have if I'm a makeup artist and and I take a picture and post it up on Instagram, is that do, do I am I giving that photo to Instagram? Do I no longer own that photo? Technically, that is how it works. Um, that's why it's a little bit dicey if you want to be sharing this stuff on Instagram. Um, they have rights to what you upload there. So if you are a makeup artist, you might want to think twice before doing that. I mean, Instagram doesn't have face filters yet. Um, Facebook did buy a popular face filtering app, so maybe watch out, but there is no precedent for that there yet. Do you think there's any chance that there, uh, I mean, I assume that's the same with Snapchat. Like if I upload a snap, that I don't own it either. I know it disappears. Is there any chance that that's where they're getting this from people's public stories? So far, I asked them if they're the ones that they'd found that had been used by Snapchat were things they uploaded and, and in those instances, no. Um, uh, Mikey Glamangor was very clear to point out that the thing that she had stolen uh, allegedly was on Instagram and, and same in the other case. Mm. Uh, well, um, I suppose we'll probably be in touch with you the next time Snapchat steals another filter, uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> I, I hope feel like... it doesn't happen. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, hey, I thought it wasn't going to happen after last time, and then we have, like, multiple uh, examples of it. So I'm sure we're going to see this again. Uh, Molly McHugh with TheRinger.com. We really appreciate you coming on today and, and talking about this, Molly. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. And uh, where, where can people follow your work online? Uh, I'm at at I am Molly McHugh and on the ringer, at, which is on this third .com. Fantastic. All right. Thanks again, Molly. Take care, Molly. Thanks, we'll talk guys. to you soon. Bye. TNT's fan of the day is Gary Brooks at TRSPT Fire. True. Spit Spitfire. Spitfire. TR Pit Spitfire. <laughs> We're trying to figure it out, Gary. Sorry. Uh, he says, Twit helps me stay awake all night. Third shift can be rough. Gary is an electrical controls engineer. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. All right. Let's see if I can do this, Megan. Coming up, <laughs> we may finally have a name for the next version of Android. But before we get to that, let's take a minute to thank Wealthfront, the sponsor of this episode. You invest for the long term, for you, for your family's financial health, but trying to do it yourself can be really complex and time consuming, especially if you want to do it the right way. Well, luckily, there's Wealthfront. Traditional advisors charge huge fees between 1% to 3% of what they manage. But with Wealthfront, you pay one quarter of 1% a year. That's 25 basis points, zero commissions, and no hidden fees. That's less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account. There are no additional charges for any of Wealthfront's services. With Wealthfront's new portfolio review, you can see if your portfolio is at risk, how diversified your investments are, uh, what you're losing to fees, even minimize your taxes. You can get started investing today with as little as $500. It only takes a few minutes to sign up. When you go to Wealthfront.com, it goes right to work, starts monitoring your portfolios around the clock, takes action as soon as an opportunity arises, and uh, Wealthfront's transparent. It's accessible. You can view and track all your accounts in one single place. And now, Wealthfront can track both your Wealthfront and your non-Wealthfront bank and brokerage accounts uh, that they'll provide in a summary of all your assets. You can also see every trade that Wealthfront makes on your behalf in your dashboard on your desktop or with their mobile app. Wealthfront's process is based on Nobel Prize winning academic research and the best investment practices. We've heard from many Twit fans who've used Wealthfront and who love uh, how they can diversify their portfolios and buy stocks from in-demand companies like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, all commission free. Wealthfront manages almost $3 billion in client assets. It's growing rapidly every day, so you have no reason to wait anymore. Just invest in your future and get started today with Wealthfront. Visit Wealthfront.com slash TNT to sign up. You'll get your free personalized investment portfolio. You'll see the customized allocation they recommend for your profile. And just for Twit listeners, if you sign up to invest, Wealthfront will manage your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. Join the many Twit fans who've seen huge success with Wealthfront and claim your offer today. That's Wealthfront.com slash TNT. All right, Android versions always begin as a letter in the alphabet and end up as some sort of tasty treat, be it a dessert, a uh, candy, a pastry. This year with version N, Google has put out a call to its fans and users to help them come up with ideas for a tasty treat. But with its latest developer preview, 
that released yesterday to those of us who are too impatient to wait for the final release later this summer. Uh, we were treated instead to a big fat joke. And the winner, at least for now, is Namey McNameface. It's a good thing Google's taking this naming thing seriously, I think. But you can get right to it in the, in the system here. Let's see if I can do a, I'll do a, do you th First of all, before I find this, Megan, do you think that naming McNameface is of, a good alternative to desserts? Of course. I would love a naming McNameface <laughs> dessert. Nanny, 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 <laughs> a nanny McNameface. Do you think it would be chocolate, marshmallow, peanut uh -huh. butter? I, well, I love it. Let's see. Let's see. So you get to the about, and you tap it a few times, and then you hold it. And then there you go. It must be true because there it is in settings. Yes. I'm pretty sure this is only temporary. Naming McName face. And this will be the last blank McBlank blank thing we do on this show. Because I think <laughs> this is theme the theme keeps coming up. <laughs> we keep going back to the blank McBlank blank uh, yeah, joke. It's funny. But uh, there we go. This time you go. <laughs> it's funny. Or it was. Funny. I don't believe you. It was. Maybe it's it funny was. the first nine times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. We can blame Google for that horrible uh, joke. And uh, I'm still curious to know what end dessert they're going to choose. Uh, but it's my job to be curious. What do you guess? guess what are your guesses? <clears throat> Everybody seems to be pointing to Nutella. Mm. Um, there's Nymo Bar, which I've never heard of other than now. Right. That like, was like a story. Nougat, that, Nougat's yeah. another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like Nom Nom. Mm -hmm. Nom 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 Nom. They need to break, break form. But I think that still relates because desserts are very Nom Nom. So... <laughs> True yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to finish now. Okay. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. You can also listen to us on your Amazon Echo. That's what I like to do. You can listen by uh, asking to listen to Twit Live if you're uh, listening at the time we're on or just to play on TuneIn. Just ask, Alexa, play Tech News Today on TuneIn. You just did it. I did it. Alexa's <laughs> everywhere. You can find me on Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole, and Greg, running the words, and all the folks who help us produce the show every single day. Thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you tomorrow. Do it with your left arm. <laughs> that was awkward. Yeah.